Miriam, and then we will um, we can launch right into your presentation. So thanks everybody for being here today. Um, we're very fortunate to have Dr. Miriam Zatabi with us. She's an assistant professor of women, gender, and sexuality here at UVA. I'll give you a, an intro on her before she goes into her talk. Um, Dr. Zatabi has a PhD in comparative literature and a graduate certificate in film studies from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Her recent research has focused on the ramifications of sex work in Iran from the constitutional revolution of early 20th century to the present day through the lens of Persian literature and film. She is particularly interested in women, gender, and sexuality studies and the intersection of religion and feminism. Her current research centers around the issues of child marriage and the Me Too movement in Iran. Her works have appeared in the International Journal of Persian Literature, The Guardian, and the Journal of Middle East Women's Studies. She's current, as I said, a current um, assistant professor here um, in the Department of Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies and Middle Eastern and South Asian Languages and Cultures. Dr. Zatadi's talk today is titled Hashtag Iran Revolution, where the significance of this movement and the world's response to it will be discussed. Dr. Zatabi, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you so much for your introduction. I want to thank everybody for being here. I know you're taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. And I'm very grateful to you to, uh, to care about my country and want to know about, wanting to know more about it. So I have a presentation. Let me share the presentation with you. It has been extremely slow for some reason, but I hope it works. And I hope I won't make you motion sick with all the zooming in and zooming out, but it will stay So, um, for the past couple of months, Iran has seen an unprecedented uprising in the country, which is being led by its valiant youth, but in particular its um, very young girls and women. So today we want to talk about this uprising, which has become known on social media as the hashtag Iran revolution. And we want to talk about like, why did it start? How is it going? What has been the consequence of this uprising for people? And how has it changed anything in the country and also the perception of the world about Iran as a country? So let's begin at the beginning. I want to tell you about the timeline of the events. Uh, you're probably familiar with this figure. This is Mahsa Jina Amini, you know, the girl who died um, at the beginning of this uprising. So people who have taken the streets of Iran basically are doing so to avenge her blood. Um, this is exactly what Mahsa Jina Amini was wearing. This picture was taken a couple of hours before she was detained by the morality police. Uh, she's from the Kurdish region in Iran, as she had gone to the capital to Tehran, and she was just walking on the street with her brother when she was detained by the morality police. And uh, on September 13th, as you can see, she's wearing her hijab, so it was not about, you know, ha having not covered her hair. She had covered her hair. But the morality police is very subjective, so they can decide what they find fault with. And what they found fault on that particular day was her um, seemingly, or, you know, in their own opinions, tight trousers. So basically, they just detained the person for her tight trousers. They took her inside a van. Um, eyewitnesses say that inside the van and also in the detention center that they took her to, they basically beat her. And on September 16th, Masa Amini dies as a result of the trauma to her head. And I mean, on the same day that she was detained, she was taken to the hospital and she had been, she was undergoing treatment, but unfortunately she dies eventually on September 16th, three days after the, uh, she was detained. And the journalist who broke the news about what happened to her, she's right now in prison in Iran because each time that you as a journalist are trying to unearth something or explore something that is uh, that the regime has done to the Iranian people, or they try to you know sweep it under a rug and this time they have you know attained, detained the journalist and she is being accused of espionage for foreign powers again that's not a new charge it happens a lot every time that the regime does not like what you're doing you are waging war against god or you are you know a spy for foreign powers um so Mahsa is taken to her hometown uh to be buried and Protests, you know, erupt after that. All over the country, people, you know, take to the streets to 
uh, basically uh, object to the fact that you can't be killing people when they're just walking on the street and doing nothing, basically, because you don't like their trousers or whatever. And uh, Iranian women in particular start burning their scarves because what they were saying was that this is about body autonomy. This is about uh, agency. This is about choice, right? The choice to whether you want to cover your hair, cover your hair, right? But if I don't want to cover my hair, that should be my choice. And nobody, no entity should be telling me or should be enforcing or should be imposing, you know, something like that on me. So that was the whole, you know, idea behind this revolution that you should not be imposing anything on the Iranian people if they don't want it. And the hijab uh, law in Iran is very interesting because it doesn't matter that you're even if you're not a Muslim in the country, even if you are Jewish or you are Christian, you still have to cover your hair. So it is like all encompassing. Every woman in the country has to do it. They don't have a choice. OK, then uh, on September 21st, they started the Internet blackout. And this is very important because each time you know something happens in the country, they are you know suppressing protests. Uh, they shut down the internet so that nobody can hear the cries of help by the Iranian people. Um, three years ago, uh, they shut down the internet. There was a total internet blackout uh, in the span of three days, three days only. They killed 1,500 people on the streets of the country. And this time when they shut down the internet, it was really bringing back all these traumas and all these memories that they are going to kill people. But they have become really innovative. So this time they shut down the internet, they suppressed the protests, and then they reconnect the internet and they spread the news of how horribly they are you know, suppressing people, how they're beating, they're killing, they're injuring people to intimidate people, you know, to stay home and not go and attest the, attend the protest. Uh, September 27th, um, this news added more fuel to the protest because news of the sexual assault on a 15-year-old girl uh, was publicized. And the, you know, the interesting thing about this one is that instead of um, arresting the person responsible for this sexual assault, who was a police commander, they put the girl and her family under house arrest. So it just shows how corruption is, how, how rife corruption is in, in, in the country and how injustice is just so widespread. As this added um, more fuel to the uprising and people were really, you know, displeased with what was going on. Uh, I have to say, these are the most important things. So throughout all of these, you know, times, um, people were out on the streets protesting, but I can't, you know, tell you about all of them. So I'm just telling you about the most important events. So then we had September 30th, or when the regime opened fire on worshippers who were just saying their prayers, you know, saying they had congregated to say their prior prayers in Zahedan, one of the cities in Iran. And they killed over like um, 90 plus, it, it is back then, over 100 people died as a result of that. Uh, so let's go to, uh, to October and what happened then, October 2nd. Uh, the police or the security forces, because we do not have just one security force, we have in Iran, we have the uh, police, obviously, we have the army, we have the revolutionary guards, and then we have the militia, which is a volunteer organization that has just full power to do whatever it wants with the people. Um, so on October 2nd, they attacked the University of Sharif University of Technology, it's the best university of technology in Iran, and uh, we have a lot of alumni um, from the Sharif University of Technology at EVA too. Uh, so basically, they trapped the students who were protesting on the grounds inside the university, and they, they started attacking them, beating them, kidnapping them, and then, you know, a, a lot of them ended up in prison. Uh, um, then, you know, on October 10th, people started like, yeah, they were protesting on the street, but they started to become more serious, and uh, they went on strike. So people who could not go on protest on the street and, you know, basically... Um, offer their lives on the street for this revolution, for the cause, they started going on a strike. So very recently, people like truckers, for example, went on strike for multiple days. Because the reason for all these strikes is these people want the regime to completely go, right? They don't want the hijab law, for example, to complete, to, to go. They are talking about the fact that we, want, we don't want the Islamic regime at all in the country. It has to go and we want a democratic regime to replace it. So we need to be very clear about that. And as a result of that, they want to bring the Islamic regime to its knees. And one of the things that they're doing is going on a strike so to economically paralyze the, the regime. 
on October 14th, um, the students at this uh, high school in one of the cities in Iran, they refused to sing uh, um, a pro-regime song, right? And because of that, the principal of the university called the security forces who went to the, university, to, the, to the high school and started beating the high school children. And one of them, this beautiful girl, died as a result of that. And attacks on high schools and schools in general have happened multiple times. So the, the teachers or the principals actually called the police, called the security forces. They would go to, to the schools, they would detain the children, and they would send them to psych, psychiatric wards to be corrected. I, I really shudder to think what exactly is happening to these children to be corrected. And then one of the things that they have been doing is creating more drama and more tragedy to deflect attention from what is going on and from the protest. And one of the things was basically they have detained thousands of people. They took them to prison, to Evin prison, which is a notorious prison because the best and the brightest of the country are in this prison because of protesting. And then um, they set the prison on fire. And that was like, that was like horrifying in a sense that, okay, so they're, you're killing people on the street, you are just kidnapping people, and now you're taking them to prison and setting them on fire. And that was a second prison fire that happened in the country. So the first one happened in a smaller, you know, scale prison. Maybe it was a trial for this one, you know, prison fire. On October 15th, another Kobe competed in an international rock climbing competition without her veil. This is a huge deal, and that's why I wanted to include this. Because this woman decided that for the first time in the history of the country, in the, ever since the Islamic Republic came to power, she wants to remove her veil in an international tournament. So Iranian women have to you know, remain veiled even you know, outside the country in international tournaments because they represent the country. And she removed her veil and ever since she has gone through such some horrible times, honestly, like she was detained after that. Um, she was outside the country. She was forced back to the country. She was detained inside the country. And then um, very recently, the house of her brother was just demolished completely by the security forces because of what she has done. So the, her family is still, you know, dealing with the consequence of her removing her veil. Um, Iranian, Iranians in the diaspora have come together uh, to um, basically give voice to what is happening inside the country and to show solidarity with the people inside the country. You might have seen a lot of protests going on. And one of those, the biggest protests that happened what happened in Berlin, Iranians from all over Europe gathered in Berlin, 80,000, over 80,000 people you know, gathered in Berlin and over 50,000 people gathered in Toronto. So these protests have been happening almost every Saturday throughout these uh, you know, three months that um, Iran has had these up uprisings. And then uh, thousands of people inside the country also went to, uh, um, to well, the cemetery where uh, Masa Amini was buried on her 40th, on the 40th day after her death. And this is a picture that you can see from, from that day. Okay, let's go to November. I'm sorry, I'm talking too fast. I know what so much has happened that I want to tell you about. Uh, then we have November 15th, 16th, 17th. Um, so this is the anniversary, the third anniversary of the fuel uprising that I told you about in 2019, where 1,500 people died in the span of three days. So people, again, went on strikes. There was new, uh, you know, a fresh surge of protests on the streets of Iran. After that, you know, during this time, uh, this beautiful child uh, died as a result of, you know, she, he was not even part of the protest. He was just in his family car. His father was driving the car. And um, there was this attack on the bazaar that they were visiting by security forces. And they shot at the car and they killed him. And his father is still in a critical condition. And uh, it, it just breaks my heart, you know, how her mother was describing what was happening. So she had two children in the car and she was like, um, I hit one of my children under the seat, but because this one was chubby, he could not fit under the seat. And as a result, you know, he was shot to death. Then uh, we have November 19th to 24th, um, the attack on the Kurdish region. And I have so many firsthand, you know, I have uh, heard, heard firsthand accounts of 
what was happening in the Kurdish region in Iran, it's important to note that um, Iran has a lot of different ethnicities in the country and Kurds are one of those ethnicities. And historically speaking, ever since the Islamic Republic came to power, they have been the target of the most brutal suppression by the Iranian, by the Islamic Republic, because they were never a fan of the Islamic Republic regime, right? And they have been very vocal about this. And as a result, if, for example, in the capital, they do use live ammunition, they do use um, bird shots, they do use, you know, different pellets. But um, in order to disperse the protesters, they use tear gas as well. But in the Kurdish regions, they just directly shoot people, you know, with live ammunition. They, they have placed no value on the lives of the Kurdish people in Iran. And for days, they attacked the Kurdish region. And I remember a friend of mine saying that uh, they had no electricity. They had shut down the electricity. They had shut down the water in the region. And people were living basically under the light of their cell phones because they were afraid to even use, you know, something that had more light because security forces would immediately attack the houses and shoot, you know, shoot the houses that had light in them. Uh, this is an odd one, really. Um, how um, the FIFA World Cup became such a huge deal in Iran, but not for the reasons that you would um, think. Uh, November 50, uh, 25th was a very important day because Iran defeated Wales, right, in FIFA World Cup. But the thing is, the people who came to the street to celebrate this win were not ordinary people, were the security forces. Because the national team in Iran, which went to the FIFA World Cup to play soccer, it, it did not represent the Iranian people. So it did not have any popular backing by the Iranian people, right? Because um, I told you about Erna Zarekabi, the woman who went to the competition to the international tournament, and she is still dealing with the consequences. Her family is dealing with the consequences. But the Iranian national soccer team, you know, each time they were um, asked, like, would you, would you care to comment about what is happening in your country? The soccer players would say, no comment. It's none of our business. We are here to play soccer. You know, we don't want to comment on politics. You know, things like that. And because of that, the Iranian people were like, no, you do not represent us. You represent the Iranian regime. You represent the Islamic Republic. And it was so obvious that they represented the Islamic Republic because when they won, the security forces, just look at this picture, the security forces who were beating people, killing people, basically, and later sexually assaulting people, right, on the streets and in prison, those are the people who took to the streets waving the flag and celebrating and dancing under armored vehicles even. That was just the most grotesque thing that I have ever seen. You know, people who were just killing people are now celebrating and dancing. Then something beautiful happened. It was divine intervention because November 29th, the US defeated, the US national you know, soccer team defeated Iran. And then it was the Iranian people who went to the street celebrating. They were dancing, celebrating the fact that the US team had won you know, the game. And obviously, this was not something that the Iranian regime, the Islamic Republic, could uh, stomach. And they started shooting people again. And this um, beautiful soul died as a result of that. He was not doing anything. He was not out on the street. He was just inside his car, honking his horns. You know, that was, that's just the way we celebrate things in Iran. And just because of honking his horn, they killed him. They shot him in the head. Then more recently, in December, December 4th, um, uh, news spread on different uh, news outlets, uh, New York Times, for example, if I'm not mistaken, and so on and so forth, you know, different news uh, outlets about the morality police in Iran being abolished. And this just shows, this really makes me unhappy because um, this shows how gullible sometimes we, we are here, you know, outside the country. I mean, the news media and the journalists outside the country, because they play right into the hands of the Iranian regime, right? They say, okay, we are abolishing the morality police, and then all news outlets are talking about, oh, Iran has abolished the morality police. But what they don't talk about is that, okay, so maybe the name has changed. It is no longer called called the morality police, because it didn't used to be called the morality police. Early decades of the Islamic Republic, it was called something totally different. So the name has changed. The ideas are still there, right? So now, if a woman goes to, I don't know, a bank, say, and she's not wearing her veil, or she's not covering enough of her hair or whatever, she can be denied service at the bank. They can close her bank account. 
So the gender apartheid is still there, right? But the morality police, you know, the name has shifted, the name has changed. And it was no cause for celebration, but a lot of people did celebrate celebrated here, you know, in different countries outside the, outside Iran, thinking that the morality police has, has been abolished. Okay. Uh, the next thing is December 7th, Iranian women uh, became, well, they were considered, or they were called the heroes of the year by Time, by Time magazine. Again, this is another example of, on the surface, this is cause for celebration. Then you go and read the article that is published, you know, in Time magazine, and you see, again, we have the same problem. Again, it's very naive. It's not talking about the Iranian women's call for regime change. It's, you know, diminishing their demands to, Oh, they don't want to wear the headscarf, but that's not it. They have experienced so much more other than the headscarf. The fact that um, uh, they cannot have the custody of their children if they want to, you know, there are so many different conditions on the custody of their children. Um, they cannot leave the country without their husband's permission. For example, they need the written permission of their husbands to leave the country. There's so many other things. Like, for example, the, the age for marriage uh, changed from 18 to 9 when the Islamic Republic came to power. So it is not really about the hijab, right? It is about so many different things. And if Time Magazine, for example, diminishes all of these demands for democracy, for a better life, for a better future, for gender equality, just hijab, then we do really have a problem. Uh, December 8th, um, Mah Mohsen Shakari was executed for waging war against God. This is just sad because this is one of the protesters that was detained. Uh, 18,000 protesters have been detained in the country. Thousands of them are um, basically unknown. We don't even know, like, we don't know their names. We don't know ex where exactly they are. You know, we know that they are being detained. Their families don't know wh where they are. Uh, so they are uh, executed, Mohsen Shekari, for waging war against God. And because the Islamic Republic thinks it is the representative of God on earth, so protesting against the Islamic, Islamic Republic is waging war against God, right? And then most recently, um, Majid Rahnavar execu was executed, uh, sorry, was executed in public without the knowledge of his family. So they basically they called uh, their family this morning saying that uh, this is the address of the burial place we buried your son in. And uh, all of these people, for the sake of just protesting on the streets. And the last the last one was uh, detained 23 days ago. So in the span of 23 days, they had a sham trial and they already convicted him of waging war against God and they already, you know, executed him. And these people do not have access to lawyers, right? They are given lawyers by the regime or there's a list of lawyers that they can, you know, um, they can choose by the regime. And obviously they are not being defended by anybody. Uh, there are different precedents for what happened in Iran, and I don't want you to think that this is the first time that the Iranian people have come to the streets to protest for their rights. Uh, the uh, Islamic Revolution was successful, you know, um, beginning of 1979, right? And already March 8th, 1979, within a couple of months, Iranian women on the International Women's Day came to the streets saying, we do not want to wear a job. Right, because they did not used to wear hijab in the country prior to the revolution, and they took to the street because the um, supreme leader of the country was like, "No, now you have to wear hijab because now we are, you know, Islamic Republic." So within a month, they were out on the streets protesting. July nineteen ninety nine, um, the uh, security forces attacked the dormitories and the campus of the University of Tehran. Uh, because the students had protested um, the fact that the Islamic Republic had, you know, shut down a, a reformist newspaper just for the sake of, you know, people protesting, why did you shut down the newspaper? Um, the security forces attacked people, and one of those people is still, um, you know, lost, basically. We do not know what has happened to him. His family does not know what has happened to him. So since July 1999, they're looking for him. Then we had the Green Movement. If you remember, 2009 was the year when Iran has a rigged election and people, thousands, hundreds of thousands of people took to the street to protest. Um, and again, we had, uh, people were literally 
you know, out on the street protesting in silence. They were not saying anything. They were not chanting anything. And still the regime of press suppressed the protest by killing a lot of people, by um, imprisoning a lot of people and injuring a lot of people. And then this is a um, fuel uprising that I told you about in 2019 and the 1,500 people who died. Uh, so we do not have accurate numbers about how many people have died because obviously you cannot rely on the numbers that the Islamic Republic you know, gives us. Uh, but we know at least 500 people have died and 70 of those people have been children at least. And when I'm uh, saying children, they were like seven, nine, ten, you know, children very young who have died. And 18,000 people are in, in prisons now. And they could be executed. Uh, the last thing that I would like to tell you about are the features, the interesting things about this revolution that are, oops, what I did, what did I do? Okay, let's go back. Okay, better. Uh, the things that have been done by the regime, they have been using child soldiers because after a point, they did not really have enough people to suppress, you know, the protest. So they were like um, going to schools and bribing children to um, to wear the, you know, the gear for like security forces and to be there to intimidate people. Basically, they have been using live ammunition, birdshot, and other metal pellets. They have been using paintballs tear gas, stun grenade, tasers, and you name it, they have been using it. Uh, and other strange things that they have been doing, I mean, strange by our standards, by but it is just totally in character with them. Uh, snatching corpses. So after they kill the protesters, they snatch the corpses. They, you know, they, they snatch the corpses from morgues. And then they blackmail the families and say that, okay, we will give you back the corpses if you... Uh, keep silent about what happened so that you do not publicize the fact that we have killed, you know, your children. Um, and then when um, there have been multiple people who died attending the funeral of these people, these protesters. So basically a protester is killed and then people go to his funeral and then they are shot at again and more people die attending funerals. They have been vandalizing and terrorizing citizens, citizens who are not even protesting. It would just randomly target people to intimidate them and to terrorize them. Uh, and they deflect attention by creating new tragedies. I told you about Evan prison. They set the prison on fire and there was also this attack on a shrine of a saint and several people died in that event too. And they said that ISIS has claimed responsibility for that, but ISIS claims responsibility for anything that happens anywhere in the world. The thing is, people in Iran believe that it was actually the regime um, doing that, you know, creating that drama, creating that tragedy to tell people that, okay, look, if you want to protest and endanger our national security, ISIS, we have, you know, other powers around us that are going to, you know, attack our country. So stay in your home, don't do any, in your homes and don't do anything. Uh, then we have attacking schools, and I told you about that. They have been kidnapping protesters. So people just disappear and you don't know what, where they have gone to. Uh, they create false narratives about why the protesters have died. So a lot of like young children have died and each time they try to create a different narrative saying that, okay, uh, this one just jumped off a roof, I've committed suicide, that one was killed by, I don't know, this, this person or that person. Uh, once they claimed one of the protesters who died was bitten by a dog and that's why he died. So they do anything to say that we did not kill these people. They died of natural causes. They died of different causes, but not by the regime. But I mean, their reasons, their narratives are getting ridiculous now. Uh, they um, force people, you know, under torture to confess. And then they air the confessions on TV to again intimidate people, to humiliate the uh, the um, prisoners as well they do not allow hospitals to treat people after you know attending protests after being shot and they also do not allow pharmacies to sell medicine to them and um, one of the horrible things that we have seen recently is the fact that a lot of people who are just you know recording what is happening around them um, record their own death you know they're just recording and they're shot out and that's the last thing that is on their camera 
Uh, sham trials and executions, obviously, there are a lot of people, 18,000 people are in prison and they are in danger of being executed for waging war against God any minute. And uh, you might have seen a CNN special about um, uh, uh, detainees being raped by other security forces and by their prison guards and by their, you know, the, the people who are just interrogating them. Uh, and also during the protest, when they are shooting people, they intentionally shoot people from close range in the face. A lot of people have been blinded. It's just such, such an epidemic of people, you know, losing their eyes completely. And then they also shoot women in their breasts and also in their genitalia. And uh, um, so people who have been protesting, they have been burning headscarves. Obviously, I told you they have been cutting hair because traditionally it has been a sign of mourning uh, for Iranians. Uh, revolutionary songs and arts, a lot of them have come out of this revolution. People have been going on strikes, attending demonstrations, obviously, and we have had social media campaigns. So all of these things that have been happening to people, they are barehanded. They do not have any, any weapons or anything, basically, but all of these things are happening to barehanded and innocent people. And the last thing that I want to show you, because I know that um, I've gone over time already, is this video, basically, of a song. You might have heard this on social media before. This is called Four. And just a second. Uh, this song was created very early, you know, during this revolution, and it is based on the tweets of actual people. You know, so when asked, why are you out on the streets protesting when you know that you might die, you know, while protesting, a lot of people said for the things that they have experienced and for the things that they want, right, for the future. So what you hear now are the, some of the things that people have experienced and some of the things that people people want for the future, right? So don't be confused by for, you know, all of these words, but you'll see. Can you hear? برای تو یک کوچه رخ زیدم برای ترسیدم به وقت بوسیدم برای خواهرم خواهرت خواهرام برای تغییر مسا که پوسیدم برای شمندگی برای بیکوری برای حسرت یک زندگی معمولی برای کوده که زبال گرد و آرزوهاش برای اقتصاد دستوری برای این هوای آلوده برای ولی از شد رخت های فرسوده برای پیروز و اعتمال انقرازش برای سکت های بیگناه ممنوعه برای گریه های بی وقفه برای تصویر تکرار این لحظه برای چهره ای که میخنده برای دانش آموزا Okay, thank you so much for bearing with me. I know that's a lot of um, trauma, basically, that, you know, I um, 
gave you in the span of only half an hour. And I apologize for that, but that has been the lived experiences of the Iranian people for the past three months now. So thank you. Thank you for bearing with me. Thank you very much, um, Miriam. That was very enlightening. I was, um, I'm shocked myself. I, I think we'll open to uh, any questions that um, anyone may have. Uh, I do have one question. Do you think, um, do you think even though with all this history of protesting that there is a chance for the regime to be uh, moved to a democratic one? Uh, so this is a revolution, right? And this revolution, I mean, even the past revolution, the Islamic revolution that happened, it took, it did not happen in the span of a couple of months. It was over like several months that it happened. Um, I think there's no going back after what happened this time because in scale, this has been completely unprecedented. For months, people have been doing this. And eventually what will happen is that people will become more brave, brave enough to you know, take to the street in larger numbers because like a hundred here and a hundred that and a thousand here and a thousand that, it, it's not going to work. You know, we need larger number, numbers. Uh, the problem is that the Iranian regime does not allow the large numbers to gather in one place because there are so many security forces scattered all, you know, throughout Tehran and, you know, other big cities. So that's going to be a problem. And there's no end to the brutality of the regime. So to specifically answer your question, um, I don't know if this revolution is going to be successful, you know, if it is going to re uh, replace this regime with something else, but it has been successful in the sense that it has brought all the Iranian people inside and outside the country together. We have never experienced such a unity ever before. I'd say in the history of our country, all people wanting one thing, the Islamic regime to just go, you know, we don't know how we're going to accomplish that, but now everybody knows that we want that. And that's great. Thank you. You're welcome. Dr. Zatabi, um, we have some questions in the chat feature as well. Um, it looks like Georgia asked a question around um, if there's a regime change, how does the new regime control the police, military, morality police, if they're not in agreement? Uh, so that's the whole idea. You know, if there is a new regime, and it is, uh, you know, elected democratically, we will not have a morality police, right? We will not have revolutionary guys, guards who are just, you know, their sole responsibility is to be loyal to revolution, which is like the Islamic revolution and not, not the people, right? Um, so a lot of these people whom we see supporting this regime are doing so because their livelihood, you know, is basically... Um, you know, attached to this regime, right? And that's why they're doing what they're doing. If this regime goes, so all these people, not that these people need to go, but these jobs that they have been created to intimidate uh, people, to terrorize people, these jobs will need to go as well. And the thing is, it's not just for the Iranian people, it's also for the whole region. I mean, Iran has been doing this for years in Syria, for example. Iran has been doing this intimidating and terrorizing people in Yemen, for example, right? It, if this regime goes, it is going to be a great day for the whole region, you know, to be perfectly honest with you, because as I said, there's no end. You, you know, you cannot even fathom, you know, what they are capable of doing, not that just to people of their own country, but just you can imagine what they're doing to the people of other countries as well. And now they are, you know, the, helping Russia in the war with Ukraine, you know, sending them drones and whatnot. Uh, so, yeah, that would be uh, the day when we leave all these, you know, things that you said, morality, police and revolution wars. Um, these organizations will need to go. And also, it will be a day to celebrate for the whole world. Yes, absolutely. There's sentiments in the chat, too, around, um, of course, how heartbreaking this is to hear and see and thanks for sharing. Are there any actions that we can take from where we sit? Uh, yeah. The most important thing is to be aware of what is going on inside Iran, because 
that's the whole point of shutting down the internet by the regime, right? They shut down the internet so nobody can hear what is happening. So nobody can know what is happening, right? And well, they will never allow, uh, the UN has launched an investigation, the fact finding or fact checking, whatever investigation. Um, the thing is they will never cooperate with this investigation, the UN investigation, right? To see what is actually happening in the country. What is important is that uh, we hear the Iranian people and we basically give them all our support, amplifying their voices so that what is happening to them right now in the country is not just, you know, a sign of dustbin of history, like whatever that happened to them, whatever has happened to them in the past 40 something years, right? So awareness is a must. We want everybody to know what is happening in Iran, because if people know, the more people know what is happening inside the country, the regime cannot just go ahead and kill like 18,000 protesters just because they want it, right? Or 18,000 prisoners just because they want it. So what they are doing now is like killing one a prisoner one by one, you know, they kill one on December 8th, they killed another one on December 11th. They are trying to see what the reaction of the international community will be, right? And they will act accordingly. The first person who died, the international community, I mean, was executed. The international community did not really do much, like other than saying, oh, we condemn this in the strongest words. Okay, you condemn this, but see, your condemnation did not go anyway, did not do anything, right? So to answer your question, awareness is must, and it's important to put pressure on the politicians to do something about this, because I'm sure that um, if they hear the voices of the people here, they will try to do something. They will try to react other than just sending Twitter messages to the Iranian people saying, we support you. That's hardly enough, because we're talking about the life and death of thousands of people. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions from the group or comments? I know certainly this has been uh, raising awareness just to, from where I sit. Um, you know, I was aware of certain aspects of this, but um, I'm really, really glad that we were able to provide this platform for you to raise further awareness okay. and education around this really, really important topic. Thank you. Um, and I know you have a plane to catch here soon, so I, I don't want to keep you, um, but I certainly want to give an opportunity before we sign off for any last questions or comments. Absolutely. I, yeah. You know, thank you, Jenny, and thank you, Dr. Zaptabi. Uh, we are going to, like I said, record this, and we're going to put this up on the HRDEI website, so um, a lot more ears will hear this and mm -hmm. um, have more awareness to it. So we really appreciate your time, and thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Again, I'm so sorry, guys. I know this was too much, you know, of unhappy events, you know, just jam packed into half an hour. And I apologize for that. But I really wanted to raise awareness about the, you know, extent of the brutality of the regime. Yeah. Absolutely. We appreciate you sharing and safe travels. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you. Have a good thank day, you, everyone. everybody. Bye. -bye. Bye.